All right. Good morning, everybody. Are you able to see and hear me? Yay. Uh, it's so nice to see you. Um, I'm so excited to be here at the uh, Midwest is Best um, uh, CSTA Unconference. I'm really excited to learn with you today. Uh, I am here in Buffalo, which I am learning is an honorary part of the Midwest. And so we'll just let that uh, sort of ride for a bit. I'm going to try to share my screen and get my slides going. In the meantime, I would love if you wanted to introduce yourselves and say hi in the chat um, so we know who's here. I'd love to save some time for discussion at the end of this session. Um, and so I really welcome and invite an ongoing conversation in the chat so we can develop some ideas um, and things we'd like to be talking about in, in the chat on the side. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen. Hi, Chris Pratt. Hi, Corey. How are it's you? It's so nice to see you. It's so lovely to see you. Yeah. What can I help you with, sir? Uh, I think maybe we got it. Let's see. Um, I'm just not sure. Did that share? I had to give permission for Chrome to record my screen this morning, and it took me a minute on my, are you on a Mac or a PC, Chris? I'm on a Mac. Oh. I, had, I had to go into security. It prompted me. Oh, uh, I'm on Firefox. I'm not getting that. Let's see. Oh. Loud, use the camera. That looks OK. So sorry. Chris, while you do that, is it okay if I introduce you? Oh, please, thank you. Okay, so formally, Chris Proctor is an assistant professor of learning services at the State University of New York, Buffalo. That's the formal part. Here's what I can tell you, friends. I've had the pleasure of working with Chris, um, uh, planning events for teachers, but also in classrooms with middle school students using Unfold Studio which is what Chris is gonna share with you today. So I can vouch for you, first of all, that Chris is a wonderful and kind human. He's one of my favorite people, uh, totally biased. Um, but also that Unfold Studio is a great way to unlock computer science being accessible to kids that don't see themselves as computer scientists. So the storytelling and the interaction that Chris's platform provides for students um, to engage not only with a love of literacy, but with a love of computer science is pretty amazing. And I'm forever grateful for opportunities to get to work with Chris. So you're in for a treat. Was that enough stretching, Chris, for you to get us to share your screen? Or would you like me to? I have, If are you able to share a screen? I think I am. Let me get this into the right window and then Great. I'll, I'll be Anna for you. I just pasted my slides link in the chat. Um, there, we oh, there we go, great, fantastic. Um, thank you so much. Uh, Corey, if you'll be with us, maybe I can just yep. ask you to change the slides when we need them. Um, yep, you tell me, I'll do it. And for everybody else, you can bring the slides up there also. So if you get bored of what I'm talking about at a particular moment, you can just go forward or back as you prefer. Um, well, let me just say right back at you, first of all. Um, I met Corey in the course of my dissertation research um, and uh, it was a wild ride because we were in a classroom uh, doing dissertation research and halfway through the teacher decided that another career was calling. And so um, I sort of uh, leveled up quickly <laughs> into um, teacher and researcher uh, and Corey leveled up from uh, sort of uh, playing a supporting role to playing a much larger supporting role, which was a wonderful time. And we became uh, close friends over the course of that. So a happy ending to that. <laughs> Um, but uh, yeah, maybe I'll go ahead and get started. Um, so let's go to the next slide, please. You can push to the right or just, you should be able to. I'm push. trying and it doesn't, there we go. Okay, sorry. Oh, there we go, great. So I am uh, in my third year as an assistant professor at the University of Buffalo SUNY. Um, our learning sciences group is uh, growing quite a lot and uh, I'm really, really thrilled about some of the colleagues I have there. Um, I, I could spend the whole talk talking about that, but uh, basically it would love to um, engage with folks who are uh, involved in CS teacher preparation, in uh, K-12 computer science education, looking at uh, critical angles on all of this. My Current uh, research is building on some of what I'll talk about a bit more in the talk, 
on thinking, sort of rethinking computational thinking, thinking about what are we, what are we aiming to have come out of our efforts toward uh, computer science education? And this is rooted also in some ongoing conversations around uh, what, what are the rationales we're drawing on for why we think this is a good thing in the first place. I uh, did some research a few years ago uh, documenting a school district as it went through the course of deciding uh, what kind of computer science they wanted to offer on a K-12 basis. And that turned into a real mess. <laughs> it was a really difficult conversation. And we found, among other things, that a lot of the inequities that exist in computing classrooms and that keep people out of computing classrooms also kept the community out of that conversation. And so some, a lot of my research right now is, is looking at um, drawing on models of urban planning, for example, of how do we help people who don't necessarily have a background in computer science already learn enough so that they can be agentic and feel like uh, legitimate participants in conversations around their children's education and the values that that community has toward their schools. Uh, so a lot of neat stuff happening there. The image I wanted to show on the left side of the screen is uh, gonna be kind of iconic over the course of this presentation. It's a picture uh, that I sort of sketched over a while of all of the various ways that computing is woven through our lives. Uh, there are certainly some teaching and learning environments. You can see uh, some children in a classroom actually doing Unfold Studio, <laughs> playing with um, a bunch of educational robotics, uh, a lot of computers in the classroom. There are people use computing at home. People, we have little Roombas running around and uh, virtual reality. People use computing at work in social third spaces like cafes. Computing has really important political, economic, military uh, consequences. Um, you can see some of the uh, protests in the top right uh, that were happening in uh, Hong Kong as one icon of, of protests happening around the world uh, and, and political movements happening around the world where computing, knowledge of computing, reliance on computing, understanding of how power flows through computing are really, really important uh, for the lives that we live. All of this is networked together with these green wires, and this is infrastructure that I'll be talking about a little bit later. So let's go on to the next slide. All right, so the organization today, I wanna, introduction, we did that successfully. I wanna talk about literacy-based uh, computer science pedagogy uh, as a sort of like big picture frame of, of where we're trying to go. And then I wanna jump into Unfold Studio uh, as a, a pedagogy and a tool that uh, uh, can help get us there. And then save some time for questions and discussion. Let's go to the next slide, please. Thank you. So you may have seen this before. This is an argument that Yasmin Kofai, Dablu, and I have been uh, making for a few years. We, we, we started out by um, really, although I, my background is in the classroom and I identify very much as an educator uh, and uh, working with teachers, uh, we're starting a computer science teacher preparation program. This argument initially started out actually engaging with uh, a really messy research community conversation around what we're trying to do with computational thinking. And we realized that we were actually after different goals. We were trying to do different things and that hadn't been acknowledged and it led to a lot of miscommunication and a lot of friction in the research community because people kind of couldn't see eye to eye in terms of each other's research. And if you've been to CS con uh, conferences, you might have noticed a phenomenon of you have different tracks, different talks with different emphases and a lot of the people who are ostensibly part of the same community really aren't actually part of the same community necessarily. They don't necessarily understand the bases for or the methods behind each other's research or the kind of goals that each other's research is after. Um, there's been some really painful tension around uh, an upcoming computer science conference, which I think highlights this as uh, much as anything. Um, and so our goal here was arguing for theory dialogue let's not commit to one narrow view of what computer science is going to be, but instead drawing on the decades and decades of really profound research in uh, educational research, not just in computer science, understand that education has many goals and purposes that are political and are rooted in different uh, stakeholder communities with different histories and different experiences with the project of education in the US and create a patchwork of theories with a recognition that no one of them is gonna put them all in, is gonna be able to tell the whole story. So we've, we view this in a sort of uh, nested concentric circles with cognitive learning at the center. This is skills and knowledge, like the content knowledge, the, the uh, what 
Paulo Freire talks dismissively about as the sort of banking concept of education, like the the stuff you load into kids and then they can export it back out again on the test and show that they learned and off we go. Uh, the vast majority of uh, CS education research is framed in terms of cognitivism, the sort of input output information processing kind of model. The next layer out though is a situated view and understanding that learning is really about becoming someone and becoming someone in a social context. It's about building identities, it's about participation in communities of practice, the apprenticeship, becoming part of what it means to do computer science, becoming the kind of person who does computer science, learning how to talk like a computer science person, uh, learning how to show up in those communities. I think back to when I was an English teacher about how when we would go to the library in the high school, some students knew how to walk into the library and be in that space. They knew what it meant to browse a book. They knew uh, how to ask whether it was okay to check a book out or, and other students were profoundly uncomfortable in that space. All of, the, all of the messaging was, you don't belong here. They didn't have a lived experience of going to the library. And so, well, from a cognitive perspective, these kinds of uh, ability to enter a space and become a certain kind of person don't feel like they have necessarily, like, uh, like how would you test that? Uh, a situated view says, this is really what's important in learning. And then a critical view zooms out even more and says, yeah, yeah, but it's, it is important what's certainly like the skills and knowledge we're learning, and it's certainly important also the kind of uh, interpersonal uh, situated learning that's happening at a sort of local social context. But ultimately, we need to have in conversation the, the broader view of what is computer science? What is it to do computer science? Uh, can we challenge that? Can we push back on that? It's no use taking a purely situated view of like learning to become a computer scientist if what it means to be a computer scientist is implicitly defined as people who don't look like you. Uh, and so what, be, what comes into focus here a lot is participating in decisions around legitimacy. Like, like can we, at least on a local school level perhaps, and this is a big interest of mine, uh, push back on what it means to be a computer scientist? Uh, can we push back on what legitimate computer science practice looks like? I, I think that there's a huge role for uh, academics in the work of deciding what is computer science going to look like, but I think it's a supporting role. I would love to see uh, drawing on the model of English language arts, my own uh, sort of uh, background field as a teacher, but also on arts and a lot of other fields and actually even computer science in a lot of professional practice contexts. I'd love to see a whole bunch of different kinds of computer science being practiced. Uh, you would never say that there's one right way to write, one right way to make poetry, one right way to make music, uh, and that people who aren't sort of like following those particular uh, standards. Like if you went to a particular high school poetry club and you're like, you're doing it wrong, you would never say that. And uh, I think that there's a lot of room for uh, K-12 computer science to, to um, embrace a pluralistic view as well. Uh, we know stuff that's valuable and rich when we see it as teachers. And we, and we know how to build that in a way that is reflective of, of the communities that we're working in um, and sort of emerging from those communities and their concerns and their identities. So I'm, I'd, I'd love to see more of that. So we've argued for the idea of computational literacies. Uh, what is a literacy? What is going on with us? Um, I'm working on a piece of writing right now that will, uh, is going to be sort of like a little bit, uh, let's take it down a couple notches and, and just clarify this. But um, De Sessa uh, provides, who, who spent his career as a computer scientist, uh, he's one of my real uh, people I look up to, uh, provides a definition that's, that's uh, Pretty, pretty crisp, like literacy is a socially widespread patterns, deployment of skills and capabilities in a context of material support. That is an exercise of material intelligence to achieve valued intellectual ends. So there's a couple things here. First of all, uh, the, the, the three circles that you saw on the last page are a way of, de of describing uh, De Sessa's view of literacy having a sort of cognitive component and a social component. And we sort of extended that to say there's a critical component as well. Um, but the idea uh, is that literacy is exercised at all of these scales at once. It's sure, if you wanna, if you wanna do print literacy, you, know how to, you have to know how to read and write. You have to have the cognitive skills to manipulate the, the uh, symbolic systems of, of reading and writing. But you also have to have the situated uh, skills. You have to know what it means to read and write in a particular context. And then you have to have the critical understandings as well 
of the ways that power flows through our world of print, the ways that the law is basically an exercise of turning words into action, turning words into exercises of power. So for computational literacies as well, this is an argument that we ought to be pursuing educational goals at all three of those scales at the same time. We ought to have um, these epistemologies in mind uh, because that's really what's what's core here is that uh, these are not just different goals, but these are different ways of viewing what is knowledge fundamentally. These are different articulations of what does it mean to learn. And one thing I think is going to run through all of this sort of theoretical argument, which I'm wrapping up so we can move on to actually seeing some tools that I've been developing on how to do it, uh, is this sort of situated argument about knowledge, that knowledge and learning is profoundly connected to the conditions in which it's learned. So that means if you are an educator who's committed to equity and social justice, you need to be engaged with not just what are your students learning, but what are the conditions in which they're learning it? And that, is, that certainly goes for the world of research as well. The conditions in which research is produced are profoundly tied to the findings, which goes actually is a pretty big challenge to the idea of positivist science. Uh, the idea that uh, the methods that you use are not just sort of like whatever is most helpful, but they shape the kind of findings you have. And even the lived experiences of the researchers, the location of the research team, the, the identities that they, that they ascribe to or that are imposed on them shape the perspectives they have. And um, uh, we had a, a, a wonderful celebration of, of the career of um, Dr. Uh, James Banks, uh, the founder of multicultural education at UB this last week. And, and he left me with this uh, really wonderful definition of, of knowledge as the processes by which people make sense of their experience. And so the experiences you've had and the processes that you had familiarity with shape the kind of knowledge that feels real and important to you. We'll leave that to the side for a moment. Um, let's go on to uh, the one more slide, please. So this is just a, a concluding picture of the sort of theoretical framework that I'm working in. Uh, I see this sort of dimension of, of practices, uh, the kinds of things we're doing with computational literacies in school and out of school in terms of cognitive, situated, and critical scales. We can look at the scale of like, what does a person do with computers today? How do groups of people and how do societies interact with uh, computers? And all of those I think are embedded in infrastructure. That's the stuff down below that supports these practices. If your cell phone turned off today, you would have a hard time doing you. If the internet turned off today, you'd have a really hard time doing any of the things like coming to this conference that we do on a daily basis. And so I, this vertical axis is the space of design for me also. Uh, we can look and see the kinds of things that young people are doing and experiencing with computers informally in their everyday lives or in their other contexts, their, you know, their neighborhoods, at church, at school, and sports. But we can also design new tools, new forms of infrastructure that make new kinds of experiences possible. And this is where I want to go next. Uh, so let's go on to the next slide, please. Looks like that's coming up. Great. So we have here a um, slide. This is an image of Unfold Studio, which is a tool that I developed uh, in grad school uh, and continue to work on now. It, uh, we have, uh, it, it, is, it is stable, it's free, uh, it's, it's up available at unfold.studio. You can play with it now. You can use it in your classroom tomorrow. Um, I would be thrilled to uh, follow up with you afterwards if you want to write to me and, and just have a conversation teacher to teacher about how to work with this. Um, we have uh, a couple of big projects going right now to um, publish a book with uh, interdisciplinary curriculum around Unfold Studio and also to release the next version of Unfold Studio. Those aren't up yet, but it's certainly ready to go and it's in active use in uh, five different states and uh, also in Hong Kong, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, but let me tell you a little bit about it. So, Unfold Studio is a web application for interactive storytelling. It's a tool uh, that basically lets people read and write interactive stories, which are basically choose your own adventure stories. You might have played, read uh, Goosebumps when you were younger, for example. These books where it's like, they, they tend to be kind of like really, originally they, they came out of a really corny kind of sci-fi kind of genre of, you know, it would be this, or, or sort of like mystery or horror, like, you know, you, 
you you come to a dark cave, turn to page 55 if you want to go in or turn to page 102 if you don't want to go into the cave. Uh, but the idea is that you, you get to sort of play the story a little bit more than a linear story would. But they've also been taken up, particularly around the community of Twine, uh, in a really, really interesting um, critical intervention in digital culture and in particular in gaming. A lot of, uh, um, uh, there's been a lot of activism uh, and sort of pushback around gender, around queerness, around sexuality uh, in the really quite toxic uh, misogynistic culture of, of gaming around interactive stories. They've become a place, um, Anna Anthropy is, is a scholar uh, who I, I really admire who writes about this, of how um, games have this phenomenal potential to enact and let you experience human experience. But if you looked at the, at the popular games today, you would take away from that the idea that most of human experience is shooting other people in the head. When, as it turns out, we are much more than that. Uh, and so interactive stories have found a sort of niche subculture also in uh, articulating some of the many other ways of being uh, and ways of interacting with, with the world that uh, we have possible that are re not really reflected in mainstream gaming. So I'm really interested in drawing on that, uh, that kind of ethos uh, with this. And um, basically what you can do with Unfold Studio is it's a bit like Scratch in the interface where you have on the one side, the code and on the other side, the enactment or the, the playing of the code. In this case, you have a programming language uh, called Ink on the left, which is designed to be a good first programming language for children. Um, we can talk more. I think there's an interesting dialogue about the role of block-based programming. Um, but what's interesting about Ink is it, instead of kind of starting from uh, full strength programming language for software developers and then trying to add things in to make it more approachable, it starts, it was actually designed by a game company to let writers that they employed participate in computing and, and sort of uh, inscribe into their writing uh, interactivity, which code models really nicely. And so if you write a paragraph, a, a personal reflection or an essay or uh, a short story, that is a legitimate program in Inc. So starting from prose, which is very familiar and a really, really important modality for a lot of the other uh, teaching and learning we do in school. Uh, so really great interdisciplinary connections. We do a lot of reading and writing already in school. Uh, and then you sort of weave into that um, interactivity. You, you define different blocks of your content. You define rules for moving between them. You define uh, chances to stop the story and prompt the player with uh, what, what should we do next? And uh, you can have variables. It's computationally complete. So you can get really fancy uh, and teach a lot of more advanced uh, CS stuff, the high ceiling, so to speak if you want, but at its core, it's really, really good for representing people's experiences. And one thing that, that I found is, is extremely important is the way that in an interactive story, you are actually scripting not just the voice of the storyteller and what happens, the plot, you're also scripting the agency or lack of agency of the player. And so you can put people in worlds where what they can do is limited and you can choose the kinds of choices available to them. Uh, this has been used really powerfully in a number of contexts. I'll show you one in just a moment. But it also has social affordances. The core idea of Unfold Studio is writing stories and sharing them with your peers. And then the pedagogy, the pedagogical aspect of it is playing those stories, replaying them, performing them socially in the classroom and discussing them. And in fact, we found that uh, when we have a unit on Unfold Studio where young people are, are learning over the course of it uh, basics of how to program and how to structure, how to think about code. If there's also a thematic focus, which might be aligned with broader focuses of the school, uh, it can be a context in which young people write really personal, powerful, profound stories and share profound experiences, uh, drawing on, on parts of their lives sometimes from outside of school that often don't find space in school and give a chance to share and analyze what's going on. We've had really powerful stories written about bullying in school, for example, about uh, experiences of being racialized in school, uh, racial tension, trying to navigate uh, the boundaries of different social groups in school. And then 
people can share these stories and, and you can play them and replay them and experience from somebody else's perspective some of these social phenomena that otherwise are ephemeral often. They kind of go and it's hard to bring them back and actually um, kind of make them a, a, a fixed artifact that we can we can share and we can analyze and we can discuss and, and with, with great specificity, right? To be able to say, you know, you could have done this, you could have just left the room, but then we can look at the story and say, ah, but if you would have left the room, then this other thing would have happened. Uh, it's a particularly nice interface for, for thinking about the use of power, implicit kinds of threats uh, that get used uh, that are sometimes invisible and sometimes hard to talk about and hard to even see. So the example you have here uh, is an egg hatching simulator. Uh, this was, <laughs> I love the, th this is sort of authentic sixth grader uh, humor and interest. This is basically, um, uh, implementing a sort of a, a Pokemon-like game where you open an egg. You, it, the game, basically, you just open eggs and there's a uh, probability distribution over getting uh, sort of common or uncommon or rare or exceptionally rare Pokemons. And then it tells you what you get and then you go back and you can play again. But what I wanted to illustrate here is um, that sometimes I think uh, this comes back to the sort of tensions within the research community. There's a sense in which we have a real trade-off between uh, the sort of like cognitive and situated or critical CS learning. Uh, there's a sense that like uh, making making computer science uh, culturally relevant or accessible or uh, socially important in some way r removes focus from the core cognitive elements. Uh, I don't think people will quite say it, but a sense that it's kind of like watering down the core computer science learning or involving some trade-offs. And I think that's a, that's a distinction that we ought to reject. Uh, I think actually when people are engaging with computing in the context of stuff that really matters to them and feels really important, you see really much more uh, specific intentions and focus and interest going into uh, crafting uh, computational structures that have social meaning. And uh, my research has actually shown this as well to, to be the case. Uh, but here we can see that, that uh, it might be a little small to read, but uh, if you open the slides yourself, it's a bit easier. He's, he's actually um, working with, with a, a control structure that has a probability distribution in it. Uh, I think there's some other interesting stuff in, in here where he's adding um, comments and also uh, is adding um, text that the player is very unlikely to see. Down at the bottom, it says, if you made it to this, the ending, you're the luckiest person ever. The chances of hatching this were one in a thousand, I think. Props to you. So you can see here where this reasoning about probability is made social. It's rhetorical now. He's, he's sort of sharing with the, the person who's presumably reading his source code, which is an interesting practice in and of itself, uh, this claim that to get to this part of the story has a one in a thousand chance. And indeed, uh, you know, if, if you choose a, a sort of uh, random number between zero and one, and then you, the cutoff is, you know, greater than 0.999, that, that, that's where we're at. So I think this is an interesting example of not just a demonstration of uh, some, some you know, pretty complex uh, computing work for, for a, you know, first contact with, with computer science, but also the way that putting it in social context increases its salience and also creates really great learning opportunities because all the time we would see people playing each other's stories, reading their source code, and then adopting not just sort of topics and, and voices from those other stories, but also computational structures. Um, Corey probably remembers one of the students in that course who became a tremendous advocate of the use of variables. He would go around and just, just evangelize for how important it was to put variables in your stories. <laughs> and this is something I really would like to see happening in my classroom, because uh, then it's not coming from me. So let's go on to the next slide, please. This is from a high school sociology class, actually. Um, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a more sinister, serious story. It was written by a high school junior, identifies as a girl. And it's a story, uh, I'll sort of narrate it. Uh, it's a Thursday night, it's your third week at the frozen yogurt shop near your house. You're about to lock the door so you can start cleaning when a 30 year old man walks in, do you? And then you're presented with these choices. Uh, go to the register to take his order or tell him the store is closed. Uh, and uh, if you um, go to the register, he winks at you. Can I order a hot chocolate, please? You just turned off the hot chocolate machine. Do you, 
tell him you can't make it or make it for him. And if you say no, then he says, I'm, I'm sure you can make an exception for me. You look around for your manager. He's in the back. And so here's a moment uh, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm reading in a, a sort of literary way kind of here. I don't have like, you know, empirical proof of this. Although for other stories that uh, in my research methodology, I would sort of uh, interview authors and players of the stories to understand what they were trying to do with the stories. So there's a, there's a way to go beyond speculation, but um, I think what I, I think what I'm seeing here is she's writing about gendered power. I, I think this is a moment where she's feeling some fear, and the guy who's come to the register is putting some pressure on her, making it an uncomfortable situation uh, in a way that, if you were just sort of relating the story, it would be it would be easy for someone who hasn't had such an experience or who doesn't see it to just say like I don't know what you're talking about. He didn't do anything creepy, but there are creepy vibes here, and. I wanted to share this one because it, it's not such a computationally complex story, but it's, it's a story that does a really powerful job of enacting an experience that you can then live, you can play, you can replay. Uh, if you just comply with what he implicitly want, wants, some of these situations won't come up. So that's where replaying it and actually looking at the source code and examining the uh, sort of uh, tree of consequences that might come from different actions comes up. And I've seen really powerful work done here again, examining bullying and some of the uh, really pushing back on the narrative that bullying is easy to defeat if you're just sort of courageous and stand up to bullies, uh, showing, well, it doesn't, it's not that easy necessarily. Or uh, as I said before, experiences of race and racialization in schools. And it creates really uh, powerful moments and, and becomes the object of uh, really powerful conversations uh, and then follow up stories also. Uh, we've, uh, I want to, stop pretty soon so we can get into discussion, but we also have, did some really interesting work around social story writing. We had every student uh, write a story in which they basically lead the player through one place in the city that they know better than anybody else, or they know in a way that nobody else knows. And then we network these together because you, can, you have some of the affordance of programming languages, like the ability to import code, import parts of stories, settings, characters from other stories into your story. Uh, and so then we made a playable map of the entire city, which had this um, kind of kaleidoscopic shifting of perspectives. And across that, we started to see some of the social uh, uh, dynamics and even the history, the, the sort of geographic spatiality of the city, the ways that uh, students coming from more privilege were writing about, uh, like, I love going to the airport because that's where I take my flying lessons after school. Come with me. I'll show you all what this is like. Or I love hanging out at the country club in the summer because the pool is there and it's so pretty and wonderful. And other, other students who come from much less privilege, uh, there was one really poignant part of the story about an abandoned house where she spends a lot of time because it's quiet and she can be alone. Uh, and being able to walk around the city to different parts of the city that you probably haven't been to before you might not be allowed to go to those kinds of places and experience the different perspectives, the different ways that people experience uh, the same city and you know the part, the places they come from to this school that that brings them together ended up being really powerful. And I think uh, I'm interested in, in doing more work with that sort of uh, social collaborative uh, coding as well, uh, which is well supported by Enfold Studio. Uh, so I think that, uh, is there anything else I wanted to say there? No, I think what I'd like to do is, is I, I could talk for <laughs> hours about this, but I'd like to go on to, to your questions. If there's things that you would like for me to say more about um, or things that you'd like me to um, sort of uh, explain a little bit more. We have 15 minutes. And so um, I would love to uh, sort of follow up a little bit more. Um, I think maybe the, the best thing would be if you want to just post into the chat a question or a topic that you'd like to hear more about, I'd be happy to share about that. Maybe while people are thinking, Corey, I don't know if you, if you have any thoughts, um, some things from your perspective of, of our collaboration that would be uh, helpful to say more about. Um. Oh, here comes a question. I, I think what was so powerful, I think the city example you just shared was the most powerful and the most fun. Mm -hmm. um, I think what was really cool that I observed that perhaps you didn't touch on was that kids who didn't necessarily feel seen 
in the building in general um, or by the adults. Um, also who felt kind of marginalized in the classroom mm -hmm. suddenly had a voice and it was really cool. Um, cool is not the right word. It was just so wonderful to see each of them take ownership of their story and then engage with each other. So mm -hmm. like there was one young man that wrote a beautiful story and I started crying cause I'm a crier anyway. Um, but he was, it, it was like the first time that an adult had kind of reacted to something he had done. And he was like, it's not a big deal. It was like, no, but it is a big deal. And so then after that, he started creating more and more stories that were true to his experience. And so the other thing, it took a lot of work to get there. So I'm not saying this was without hiccups. Chris and I could talk about hiccups for a long time too. But <laughs> um, I think what ended up happening was that when Chris and I entered into the classroom, it was pretty dysfunctional. The teacher had left. The behaviors were pretty strong and challenging. There was a long-term sub who didn't have any computer science background in there. And I mean, I walked in and immediately thought like, we can't teach until we build a classroom community. And so what Unfold allowed us to do was to build a community and allowed them to interact with each other and to start to recognize that my lived experience in this town is different than others. And that's okay. I can experience through these stories what it's like to live in the city as someone else. And it took a lot of work and patience and it wasn't perfect by any means, but I think that's what it gave us. Mm -hmm. um, and I, the other thing I will say, and then I know there's questions in there was it allowed kids who loved computer science to love computer science and tell a little bit of a story, but then kids who love to tell <laughs> stories to tell a story and do a little bit of computer science. And I, I think to me, that's where the power lies is that it honored kids where they were at and it allowed them to build some foundational computational thinking and coding experiences. And ultimately that's, that's what I want for a middle school student, at least that they know it's an option and it's a way that can strengthen whatever interests they care deeply about. So it was cool. I know there's questions. So are you seeing the questions too? I am. Yeah. Uh, I, just, I have so much admiration for Corey as an educator and a supporter of educators. I'm just like, <laughs> it's anyone who gets to work with her is very, very lucky. Um, I, I'll come to these questions. I'm, I'm seeing a few of them here. Um, but I, I did want to sort of follow up, uh, Corey, on, on one thing you were saying and just make the point that, uh, and, and this is where connecting to literacies uh, research and pedagogy is so important because the thing I'm about to say is like, yeah, uh, <laughs> I could give you a thousand references for this in the field of literacies and new literacies, but it's still like pretty new in, in CS education. And, and that's where I think we can level up quickly by learning from our colleagues in the way that we've been pretty successful in, in drawing on uh, pedagogy and pedagogical content knowledge in math and science, English language arts, I think, uh, and I'm really excited for this afternoon's conversation, uh, around interdisciplinary CS. But I think some of the ways that Unfold Studio being text-based and being prose-based, uh, and this this comes to Mark's question, um, that, that invites connection to existing literacies can be a really powerful uh, means of helping students understand the ways in which text and writing can be powerful. And two, just two memories I'm having, one, was this, uh, it was a, a, a black young man who like very clearly had not been positioned as someone smart or with anything to say in the school. Uh, and he, for the first half of the unit, like did not write, would not write, um, would play other stories sometimes. And we found that I, when, I, when I sat with him and we would talk, he would have stories he would wanna tell, um, but, the, the writing was difficult at first. And so we actually used a process of, of kind of, and again, right, this is like takes a lot of resources, but uh, like sitting with him and he would actually like started, we started by having him uh, dictate the story. And I would I was just sort of writing down what he was saying. And then he would get really into the choice points. And we actually added a few variables like, no, you can't go there if you haven't done this already. Or like, it was it was taking us through his, his aunt's house in Chicago. Um, which is where the family had sort of come from in the course of the great migration. And it's, it's a family reunion and you walk into the different rooms, you meet the different family members and you, you hear their stories and you want to leave for a while because you want to get away from the family on and on it went. And um, this became a really powerful experience. And so even finding a way around the like 
whatever, however you can get your story there can be powerful. Uh, and then there were re there's such a rich conversation, which I, I don't have time to tell in its fullness, but uh, there was a, a group of students who identified as being uh, like uh, queer, gay, non-binary, uh, neurodivergent, and like who very clearly identified as being a group that was non-normative in lots of ways and were really actively supporting each other at school. And we had a lot of conversation, I had a lot of conversations with them about their sense of like, they knew very clearly which teachers were supportive, which spaces were safe at school, which spaces were not safe. They had practices of checking in on one another, uh, all of these things. And this this one student was was writing uh, pretty actively ab about um, uh, being, uh, I think they identify as non-binary, but being attracted to girls and their, and their mom was really not, really not uh, supportive of that. And, uh, they were writing a number of stories that involved gender and sexuality in the classroom. And we had very, very subtle conversations about wanting the importance of representation in stories and texts that find their way into school spaces and the impact that that can have on making it possible to be a certain kind of person who wasn't, when that wasn't possible before. Uh, but also on not wanting to have sort of like uh, pandering, like uh, the sort of like, there's a gay character, yay! <laughs> uh, in, right, in the same way you wouldn't want to just be like, like, there's a black character, so now we've solved our problems. Um, but 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 they were really really subtle and thoughtful in the rhetorical choices they were making about wanting uh, to have such characters play important roles in the story without having them being sort of there as tokens. Uh, and I thought that was really powerful, and I thought it had a big impact. I can actually study uh, in that research context who was looking at and reading those stories, and then the stories that they subsequently wrote. And so you can actually see these kinds of, not just technical practices again, but identities and voices uh, flowing. And actually there was a, um, a previous school I'd worked at, had a project um, on like, uh, you had to build a monument to LGBTQ history and you could walk around the monument and it was, who was gonna be presented there and how was that gonna show? And, and a number of people at other schools that have uh, much, uh, there's much less space to talk about gender and sexuality um, on the sort of like public distributed version of Unfold Studio, you can have a closed version just for a school also, but um, would read this story that would never have been part of the curriculum at their school and it became really important and spawned these, uh, these other stories. And so you have this like like bridging of, of, of young narratives across uh, school spaces. And I think that's really powerful too. Let me speak to a couple of these questions quickly. Mark was asking the coding language. It's a language called Ink released by originally, I didn't develop the language, um, it's released by a company called Inkle, which has been one and they, they've been leading this sort of renaissance of text-based stories. They, they won a uh, game of the year for a bunch of things, um, a game called uh, 80 Days, which we actually played in this class, where you go around the world and it's an interactive storytelling game. As I, as I said before, it was, it was developed with the really business purpose of they were hiring all these writers because they knew that if you're having a text-based game, the quality of the writing and, and the prose and the identities and characters and voices is what's going to lead it and they didn't want to have these writers have to like you know be like put your writing down and now you're going to implement java classes to like that wasn't going to work <laughs> and so uh the sort of um business need they had to have people who weren't programmers and didn't necessarily care to become programmers be able to express intentions and computational structures in as lightweight a way as possible actually ten, ends up working pretty well in an educational context too I see Rebecca's question, resources for me to implement a lesson like this, where there will be scary conversations, scary to me as a teacher. I love the idea and I can totally do this on a technical level, but discussion that might be about religion, bullying, race, sexism, scary for me. Yeah, this is real. And I, I think I should note my own privilege here as, as a white male, like I, I can say things and now as a professor, right? Like uh, you can't fire me, you don't even employ me. <laughs> uh, but I mean, I can say things that are not easy for others to say. And in some way it actually builds up my privilege because then I can be rewarded for that in a way where like many of my colleagues like are much more articulate about that, but they're like, they are in danger in ways. Uh, you know, the, 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 very thing, the very things we're talking about uh, will be used against them in ways they can't be used against me. Um, and so I think that's a real thing. And I, I wouldn't want to uh, present these stories of being like, go do it in your classroom or else you're, <laughs> Uh, right, like it's it's not possible to do this everywhere, and it's not safe to do this everywhere, and it might not be desirable to do this everywhere. But um, I absolutely think that that these kinds of resources uh, are needed. That's why we, that's precisely what we're working on right now. Um, 
and I, my intention is to present, uh, the book is going to be structured like this, some, some essays at the beginning, uh, drawing, uh, the Folger Library has some really wonderful materials called Shakespeare Set Free, and I'm just totally taking their format. Essays at the beginning, they're about like how and why to do this. I have a chapter with Ontario Garcia, who's one of my academic mentors, that is very, very much in that mode, and I would I'd point you to it. Uh, I'll put the link in the chat. Um, uh, really centering identity and voice. Um, uh, so at the beginning of these sort of broad pedagogical content knowledge kind of chapters, like how to do this, and then uh, whole content, a whole curriculum unit, like six weeks, like, you know, you're a busy teacher, you want to pick this up tomorrow and start, here you go. Everything you need, handouts, slides, uh, pedagogical tools, uh, set up on the, on the, on the tool, Every, everything you need is there, good to go. And it also has those lessons available as in an a la carte format. So if you have an existing unit or your school has an existing curricular focus on, you know, often there's like a, a guiding question for the whole grade uh, for ninth grade or something, you can take those and you can adapt them in that way. And having a number of them that are interdisciplinary in different ways, I think will provide good things to pick up on. Um, so that's, that's my best sense. But if, if you can think, I mean, I know, I know just like having materials uh, and also having the sort of research justification of, you know, as a teacher, it's nice if you can be like, well, I don't know the the researchers, <laughs> this came from somewhere legit. So that, that's backing up uh, to some extent. Uh, Chris, I, yeah. Can I just chime in briefly? Yeah. Like in Iowa, we have laws against do, addressing these kinds of things. So it's real. I totally get it. What I will say, though, is that Chris and I never prompted the kids to write about any of those. Um, I jokingly call them no-no subjects because our <laughs> teachers can, get, uh, uh, can be litigated for talking about them. But kids go there because it's what matters to them. And so sometimes I think if you're offering them the structure and a space to talk about it, they will go there. Um, and, and then it's not in your curriculum. It's what came up as part of the kid. So I don't, I'm not trying to play a shell game, but I think I have a teenager at home, a sophomore, this is the type of stuff she wants to talk about. And frankly, part of why she doesn't love school is because the teachers don't address it head on. So it's hard as a parent, because it's like, I see both sides, but our kids really want to talk about this. And they want to talk about the nuance and the unfairness the injustice in the world around them and want to be part of making it better. And so um, I think sometimes like, I feel like we, mem my memory's not awesome because it was before the pandemic, but we start out with choose your own adventure for the kids and slowly made our way to building their comfort. And then they ended up talking about identity. So framing it, I think is important, Rebecca. I think that, I mean, I, I know, I, I would be happy to share the curricular materials uh, from, from the unit that exists as, as it is now. And the essential question around that unit is, how do we build our worlds? And the question was about the relationship between the worlds we find ourselves in and the kind of people we can be. And so you can have this whole conversation just around Minecraft, right? And, and people could write Minecraft fan fiction and about how like, in Minecraft, you can't smile. <laughs> and so your face can't smile. And so, and so if you want to interact with people, you got to do it in different kinds of ways. This relationship between what kind of person can you be and what kind of world can you live in clearly goes into, into these other kinds of areas too. And I think, Corey, I think that one takeaway of like, you know, if you make space for it, even if you can't lead it there, you don't necessarily have to. You don't have to be, you know, you don't have to be the one who knows the answers to these. I think one of the things that kids discover as they grow up is that the, <laughs> the grown-ups don't have the answers. <laughs> Um, you know, but but even just, you know, someone's sharing something, you say, you know, that sounds really hard. Uh, or, um, you know, that I, I can see how that's a really complicated situation. Uh, and we've had tricky business too around like, which students are valorized for sharing struggles that they're dealing with and which students are sort of criminalized for the same kinds of things. Of being, you know, if you're, if you, if you're writing a story about how your friends are smoking pot and you're not sure if you want to, um, is that like a thanks for your courage in struggling with this? Or is that you need to take a trip to the assistant principal? Uh, so I think these are, you know, in some ways, these are hard questions are not easy answers to them. And, and, it, uh, and I think that sort of points to their importance. We can feel <laughs> that they are important things. Um, but I think the bet I would, I'll close it by saying, in my work as a researcher, I, my goal is to provide resources and support. And if that looks like building tools, if that looks like offering curriculum, if that looks like following up with a Zoom conversation and just having a talk, 
please shoot me an email. <laughs> so I'll close there. Thank you all so much. You have a 10 minute break. Um, so if Chris is willing to stick around, we can leave this room open for a little bit. Um, so if you still have questions, I really, I know you just said you're closing. I would love for you to address Drew's question. Can I read it to you since I have it in front of me? Please. Uh, so Drew said, I do an assignment similar to your tool where students write a story in JavaScript using if statements while loops. I love doing the assignment and love the idea um, behind your tool. Can you talk more about the benefits there would be of using your tool versus vanilla JavaScript? Sure, I would love to talk about that. And, and there's, a, there's, a really, there's a really interesting body of research around, as I said before, sort of like, should we be doing this in block-based programming or not? And one of the things that sort of I sort of noted as a, as a former English teacher is like, in Scratch, the boxes for text are really small. <laughs> you can't type much. Uh, it, it, it's wonderful for animation, for visuals, for art. It's not so great for textual storytelling. Now, in JavaScript, um, I have a broad hunch. So we, we've, sorry, I'm, I'm still on the blocks thing, uh, but I'll come, come to this. I, we've seen research suggesting that students have a pretty hard time moving from block-based programming onto their first text-based programming language. Right? If you learn Scratch, now you want to learn Python, students have a pretty hard time with that. And it's looking quite a bit like the, the, the learning that students do is pretty tightly bound to the context and to the interface that they're doing. Uh, you might hope that there would be some sort of abstract, like, now I know how to handle uh, abstraction and modularity. I learned it in Scratch. I can do the same thing in Python. It, it turns out it's pretty hard to do. And that leaves me with a sort of hypothesis that I haven't really tested in research at this point, but that the pedagogy is really important. Um, and the practices around text-based programming are really, really important. And this starts to get us toward JavaScript. I think things like knowing how to interact with the um, life cycle of, of sort of implicitly compilation and execution of your program, learning how to understand errors. Uh, it's really terrifying to a lot of students the first time their screen fills up with, you know, a stack trace if you're in Python and like, oh, my computer's broken. <laughs> no, it's trying to it's trying to explain to you something like, what's next? Uh, and so we've done a fair amount of work. I mean, I think one of the advantages here is that you can start from no code at all, and that's still a program. Uh, and then there are a couple of like you can just write like blocks of text and then just link them to each other in a way that feels like, okay, that's basically still writing. And so you can sort of work your way up. Uh, whereas, I mean, in JavaScript, I could imagine, you know, maybe you start, you could maybe enact the same kind of thing with a bunch of strings and then just concatenating them or something. Um, but I feel like a little more you need to um, have some of the basics working in JavaScript or else nothing's gonna happen. You're gonna get an error. Um, on that said, I think that, that the ubiquity of JavaScript and its present its presence like behind the scenes in all of our web experiences and the ability to open up the um, you know any web page, which is like the world that young people live in to some extent, uh, and and see the JavaScript and interact with it is is an incredibly compelling argument for it. So I, I'm not here to be like you know use this instead of JavaScript, um, but I think. I'll, the the sort of like low floor the idea that you can really you the, your starting place can be like on the ground like no coding at all is still a program uh, is is compelling and uh, two other things I guess I would add just to, speaking again to the importance of practices around text and other disciplines having this be just a little closer to that uh, makes it well suited to other sort of interdisciplinary practices or bringing in parts of your life from outside. Um, and I would also add that um, the social affordances built into Unfold Studio, I think, are really important. The ability to share stories, the ability to uh, fork other people's stories, um, the, um, the, the version that's coming out that has a sort of like uh, school-based kind of closed worlds uh, for, for schools where that's necessary and important, um, and, and the ability to kind of, you know, manage and handle um, Having a social experience that you can share while also being really sensitive to abuse uh, and uh, the kind of harm that can come from a social context in learning. And the, you know, if something really awful shows up on that story, is somebody in big trouble? 
these kinds of questions are, are really serious questions when you have uh, user generated content. Um, so I, I think that, that's one of the things that Unfold Studio offers is it's just kind of a, a platform that manages some of this. Uh, although, as I said before, the, the, the version that's at Unfold.Studio is, is, is public. And so um, if that's a deal breaker for your school, if having a closed private version, like, you know, we, we can uh, set that up as well. I, to, I was going to say really simplistically, Chris, was being able to fork. So like, it's like remixing and scratch is, I mean, the general idea, but like, to me, that's, that would be the power of using Unfold Studio instead of JavaScript is we could truly do use modify create pedagogies with kids. We could let them use it, whether it was the 80 days or they could go read and play other stories. And then Chris did a really good job of making skeleton projects for kids that we could then push out to them and they could make a copy. And so then those kids that were really struggling with the coding piece, they had scaffolds in place to modify existing codes before they were ever engaged with creating from scratch. And so to me, that's a strength of the platform from the pedagogy, computer science pedagogy side is mm -hmm. it truly supports whether you use prim or use modify create, whatever it is you use. Um, to me, that would be a strength and why I might choose to start with Unfold Studio before moving into a language like JavaScript. Yeah. And Corey, I think this speaks to Drew's question here as well. Um, it says, yeah, we have a few fun units before we can do the fun assignment. What is the overhead for a high schooler to get to use ink time-wise? Very low, very, right? Because you can start with, especially these template stories have worked well, where um, uh, they're, they're organized according to a sort of conceptual sequence of, of learning, right? First, the idea of like code that just sort of like sequentially executes instructions. And so you can have a story that's like written in four chunks and you click go on to get to the next chunk. Each of the, and then you have a story that's uh, an X different kinds of uh, graph structures through the story. The idea that you can like create a loop to come back to where you were, uh, but it's different maybe now. Um, all, each, each of these new conceptual uh, offerings has a template that you can fork and the, the flow of the story remains the same and you're basically just filling in new content to start, which is, it's like Mad Libs, it's very easy to do. And then you can you know, use Modify Create, go on, go on next to sort of be like, now I'm gonna try and change the flow a little bit, add this next thing, uh, that tends to work pretty well. I hate to do this because I love Chris and I'm really appreciating Drew, but I have to go because I have to facilitate a round. So uh, we don't have as too many people left. Chris, thank you so much. Oh, it's such a pleasure. You know how much I love and appreciate you anyway, but thank you for the conversation this morning and for your willingness to host an anchor session. The team is so grateful. Anybody who would love, just shoot me an email. I'd love to just have a chat if you want to follow up, talk about this or anything else. Um, thank you so much. Um, and I look forward to seeing you all around. Awesome. Okay. Thanks, everybody. You've got four minutes before the next session opens. So good luck. <laughs> Bye.